Hello doctors, I hope everyone is doing great. Welcome to Easy Medicine. In this video, we will discuss Medicine 1 past papers for final year MBBS. Before starting, it is better to know how much marks does a topic have in an exam. So here, I have provided you with distribution of marks for Medicine Paper 1. In this video, we will discuss Gastroenterology. And as you can see, you will have two questions from this topic. Also, I would like to tell you that you will see a blue box like this at bottom of your screen with every answer. It will provide you with page numbers of Davidson's book of medicine from where these answers are taken. I have done this so that you can authenticate the answers yourself and be sure that these answers are accurate. For the purposes of this video, reference page numbers are taken from 22nd edition of Davidson's book of medicine. Let's begin with our first question. Please stop the video here, read this question and try to answer and then we'll discuss it together. Alright, since the question does not ask about diagnosis, so let's see the answers. The first part of the question asked about clinical parameters by which you can assess the severity of upper GI bleed, and they include blood pressure, pulse, urine output, and presence of cold, clammy extremities. Also note any stigmata of chronic liver disease such as jaundice, spider angiomas, or ascites as part of your initial clinical evaluation as this can help you know if chronic liver disease associated varices was the underlying cause of upper GA bleed. The next part of the question asked about a clinical modality which can be diagnostic as well as therapeutic and that is endoscopy. One important point to mention here is that if esophageal varices is the cause of upper GA bleed then endoscopic band ligation is the treatment of choice for this cause of upper GA bleed. And here are the reference numbers from Davidson's book of medicine. Let's read the next question. Please stop the video here, read this question and try to diagnose and then we'll discuss it together. Very good, so the diagnosis is achalasia of esophagus. Since the students mainly struggle with reaching a diagnosis then with answering subsequent questions, so some important points that can lead you towards this diagnosis are difficulty in swallowing for solids and liquids and nocturnal coughing and vomiting of indigestive food. Let's see the answers. Here you can see the diagnosis is achalasia of esophagus. The next part of the question asks about investigations. And these investigations include endoscopy, barium swallow, which will show tapering of lower end of esophagus, giving a characteristic bird beak appearance, and manometry, which is diagnostic for achalasia of esophagus. And here are the page numbers from Davidson from where this answer is taken. Let's read the next question. Please stop the video here, read this question and try to answer and then we'll discuss it together. Excellent, so the diagnosis is peptic ulcer disease. And some important points to lead you towards this diagnosis are burning in epigastrium, passage of black tarry stools, and history of intake of some medications for joint pains, which are usually NSAIDs and they are a well-known risk factor for peptic ulcer disease. Let's see the answer. See here the diagnosis is peptic ulcer disease. The next part of the question asked about cause of peptic ulcer disease in that patient and that is long term use of NSAIDs for joint pains as we just discussed that NSAIDs are a well known risk factor for peptic ulcer disease. The next part of the question asked about other causative factors for this disease and they include H. pylori infection, smoking, severe psychological stress example burns or CNS injury, alcohol use and other drugs example iron preparations. The next part of the question asked about two differential diagnoses and they include duodenal ulcer or gastric ulcer. And the next part of the question asked about investigations if cause of peptic ulcer disease is a bacterial infection and that bacterial infection is usually H. pylori. And for that, investigations are of two types. First are non-invasive investigations, and they include serological testing, urea breath test, or fecal antigen test. The second type of investigations are invasive investigations, and they include endoscopy with enteral biopsy, followed by histological analysis, rapid urease testing, and culture of that biopsy specimen. The last part of the question asked about drugs to be used for treatment if the cause of peptic ulcer disease is a bacterial infection. And those drugs include proton pump inhibitors, metronidazole, tetracycline, and bismuth substrate. This is quadruple therapy for eradication of H. pylori infection. There is also a triple therapy for eradication of H. pylori infection, which we will discuss in one of next questions. And here are the reference page numbers for Davidson. Let's read the next question. Please stop the video here, read these questions, and try to answer, and then we'll discuss them together. The 
Good, so the diagnosis is ulcerative colitis. And some important points to diagnose this condition are history of chronic bloody diarrhea and associated crampy abdominal pain. Ulcerative colitis is associated with many conditions and one of the conditions is arthritis and it can cause joint pains as you can see in the second scenario. Let's see the answers. And as you can see the diagnosis is ulcerative colitis. The next part of the question asked about features of severe disease and they include bloody stools 6 or more in 24 hours, pulse 90 per minute or more, anemia in which hemoglobin is less than 10, temperature of more than 37.8 degrees celsius and ESR of more than 30. And the criteria for severe ulcerative colitis is bloody stools 6 or more in 24 hours plus one or more from the above mentioned features. The question also asked other causes of chronic diarrhea and they include Crohn's disease, celiac disease, ischemic colitis and colonic carcinoma. The last part of the question asked about groups of pharmacological drugs used in this condition and management of this condition. So here is the management and it begins with history and physical examination followed by investigation and investigations for ulcerative colitis are complete blood count, ESR, endoscopy with biopsy and this investigation is diagnostic for ulcerative colitis and it includes ileocolonoscopy or sigmoidoscopy. The other investigations are barium follow through, plain abdominal x-ray and stool microscopy and culture. The last part of the management is treatment and treatment is provided by various groups of drugs such as aminosalicylates, example sulfasalazine and misalazine and corticosteroids, cyclosporin, anti-TNF antibodies, example infleximab, and thiopurines, example azathioprine. These drugs are used at different times depending upon the activity of disease. For example, active disease is treated with topical and oral aminosalicylates and if these are unable to control the disease, then oral corticosteroids are used. And severe disease is treated with intravenous corticosteroids or immunosuppressive drugs, for example cyclosporin or anti-TNF drugs, example infleximab. If the symptoms are still not controlled, then surgical treatment is provided, which involves resection of colon and rectum. And here are the reference page numbers from Davidson. Let's read the next question. Please stop the video here, read this question and try to answer and then we'll answer it together. Alright, since the question does not ask about diagnosis, so let's see the answers. The first part of the question asked about non-invasive and invasive tests to confirm the infection. So the non-invasive tests include serology, urea breath test and fecal antigen test. And invasive tests include endoscopy with enteral biopsy followed by histological analysis, rapid urease testing and culture of that biopsy specimen. The second part of the question asked about triple therapy for eradication of H. pylori infection. And the triple therapy includes proton pump inhibitor example omeprazole, amoxicillin and if the patient is allergic to penicillins then metronidazole can be used in its place and clarithromycin. All these drugs are given twice daily for 14 days. We have discussed quadruple therapy in one of the previous questions. Please do not confuse that quadruple therapy with this triple therapy. That quadruple therapy is only used if this triple therapy fails to eradicate the infection. And here are the reference page numbers from Davidson. Let's read the next questions. There are actually four questions from this topic. Two of them are mentioned here and two you will see in just few seconds. Please stop the video here, read these questions and try to answer them and then we'll discuss them together. Very good, so the diagnosis is celiac disease. And since this topic is really important, so some points which can lead you to this diagnosis are chronic diarrhea without mucus or blood and associated weight loss, anemia and low calcium. There is also a deficiency of vitamin D which develops in these patients, which results in bone pains and short stature. And here you can see similar points in next two scenarios as well. Let's see the answers. And as you can see, the diagnosis is celiac disease. One of the questions asked about 10 initial tests which you will perform in a patient without a known underlying cause of chronic diarrhea. So the tests to perform on a patient with chronic diarrhea without a known underlying cause include stool examination for ova and parasites, stool testing for fat, abdominal ultrasound, CT scan or MRI, barium follow through, 
endoscopy with biopsy, plain abdominal x-ray, stool and blood cultures, serological tests for infections, CBC and ESR, and fecal calprotectin and fecal elastase testing. The other questions asked about investigations which can help in diagnosing the condition. So some specific tests for celiac disease are duodenal biopsy which is a gold standard test and shows villus atrophy, crypt hyperplasia and intraepithelial lymphocytes. Antibody assays done in celiac disease are for anti-endomysial and anti-tissue transglutaminase antibodies and complete blood count and biochemical tests, example serum calcium, vitamin D, total protein and albumin levels. Apart from serum calcium and vitamin D, total proteins and albumin levels are also decreased in celiac disease and it results in edema which was present in a patient described in one of the scenarios. The next part of the question asked about treatment and treatment of celiac disease involves correction of existing deficiencies of calcium, vitamin D, iron and folate with mineral and vitamin supplements, commencing lifelong gluten-free diet which involves exclusion of wheat, rye, barley and initially oats. And this dietary therapy is mainstay of treatment for celiac disease. A very small number of patients who do not improve with the gluten-free diet are treated with corticosteroids or immunosuppressive agents. One of the questions asked about diseases associated with celiac disease and they include type 1 diabetes mellitus, pernicious anemia and dermatitis herpetiformis which is characterized by an intensely itchy rash on elbows and knees. And here you can see that this question asked about name of this condition. One of the questions asked about other causes of villus atrophy and they include tropical sprue, GIDSS, radiation and Whipple's disease. One of the questions also asked about long-term complications of this disease and they include cancers such as enteropathy associated T-cell lymphoma, small bowel carcinoma, squamous carcinoma of esophagus. And since we discussed that calcium and vitamin D deficiency develops in this disease which will result in osteomalacia and osteoporosis. And here are the reference page numbers of Davidson from there these answers are taken. Let's read the next questions. Please stop the video here, read these questions and try to answer and then we'll discuss them together. Very good, so the diagnosis is irritable bowel syndrome. And some important points that can lead you towards this diagnosis are abdominal pain that improves after passing stool and altering bowel habits that is diarrhea alternating with constipation. Let's see the answers. Here as you can see the answer is irritable bowel syndrome. One of the questions asked about alarm features and they include age of the patient more than 50 years, male gender, weight loss, family history of colon cancer, anemia, rectal bleeding and presence of nocturnal symptoms. The next part of the question asked about investigations and they include complete blood count, fecal calprotectin and sigmoidoscopy. The last part of the question asked about treatment and treatment begins with reassuring the patient that symptoms are not due to a serious underlying disease. This can help relieve patient's anxiety. If the reassurance alone does not work then treatment is tailored according to the predominant symptom which can be constipation or diarrhea. So constipation predominant irritable bowel syndrome is treated with high fiber diet, lactulose and lanactotide. And diarrhea predominant irritable bowel syndrome is treated by avoiding gluten and excessive fiber in diet and using anti-diarrheal drugs for example loperamide. And pain and blotting which also occurs in irritable bowel syndrome is treated with low FODMAP diet, avoiding wheat and dairy in diet, probiotics and spasmolytic drugs example hyoscine. Some patients may also benefit from amitriptyline or amipramine. If the patient does not get better with these then additional therapy includes psychological interventions such as relaxation therapy, hypnotherapy and biofeedback. And drug which can be used in such refractory cases is duloxetine. And here is the blue box with reference page number from Davidson from where these answers are taken. Let's read the next questions. Please stop the video here, read these questions and try to answer and then we'll answer them together. Very good, so the answer is pseudomembranous colitis. And some important points which can lead you towards this diagnosis are fever, bloody diarrhea, recent hospitalization or recent use of antibiotics. Let's see the answer. 
Here, as you can see, the answer is pseudomembranous colitis. One of the questions asked about cause of the diarrhea. And the cause of this diarrhea is Clostridium difficile infection as a result of using antibiotics. The next part of the question asked about investigations to diagnose this condition. And they include stool culture, screening stool for Clostridium difficile nucleic acid by PCR, and if screening is positive, then using ELISA for detection of Clostridium difficile toxins. The diagnosis of pseudomembranous colitis rests upon detection of Clostridium difficile toxins in stool. And the other investigations which can be done in this disease are abdominal and erect chest x-ray. The last part of the question asked about treatment. And treatment begins by stopping the causative antibiotic, providing supportive therapy with IV fluids and resting bowel. The mainstay of treatment of pseudomembranous colitis is antibiotics. And they include metronidazole or vancomycin. Metronidazole is the first line antibiotic. And for relapsing disease, fidaxomycin is used. For refractory cases, administration of intravenous immunoglobulins, corticosteroids, and fecal transplantation is done. And here is the blue box with reference page number from Davidson. Let's read the next question. Please stop the video here, read this question, and then we'll answer it together. Good, so the diagnosis is gastroesophageal reflux disease. Even though the question does not ask about diagnosis, but this condition is really common and it can show up in your MCQs or SP apart from short essay questions. So it will be helpful for you if we discuss some important points to diagnose this condition. And they include heartburn, indigestion, and water brash. Water brash is actually increased saliva production when acid reflux reaches the throat. Apart from these symptoms, another symptom which is common in patients of gastroesophageal reflux disease is regurgitation. And some of the risk factors of this disease are also mentioned in this scenario. And they are obesity and hiatal hernia, as you can see here. Let's read the answers. The question asked about types of hiatal hernia. And they include sliding hiatal hernia and rolling or paraesophageal hiatal hernia. The second part of the question asked about complications of gastroesophageal reflux disease. And they include Barrett's esophagus, esophagitis, anemia, and benign esophageal strictures. The last part of the question asked about treatment, and treatment of this condition begins with lifestyle advices such as weight loss, avoidance of late meals, and smoking cessation, acid-lowering drugs such as proton pump inhibitors, antacids, S2 receptor antagonists are used if lifestyle advices fail to control patient's symptoms, and among these, proton pump inhibitors are mainstay of treatment for gastroesophageal reflux disease. If the patient's symptom does not improve with these, then anti-reflux surgery is done. And here is the blue box with reference page number from Davidson from where these answers are taken. And this finishes our discussion on past papers of gastroenterology section of medicine paper 1. Before ending this video, I am sharing with you some bonus MCQs. These MCQs are made from some important topics. You can solve these MCQs by stopping the video and writing your answers in comments below. I'll share the answers to these MCQs in a comment below after a week of uploading this video. If you have any query, feel free to ask, I'll be happy to answer. If you like this video, give a thumbs up and share it with your friends so that they can benefit with these past papers as well. Please subscribe and hit the bell icon for upcoming past paper videos. Good luck!